Good morning, class. Um, greetings from Fairfax, Virginia. This is Nathan Leslie speaking. And today I am going to <clears throat> talk a little bit about the uh, the letters of um, Abelard and Eloise. Now, this is topic three on the presentations. Uh, it's a really fascinating um, text. Um, this is topic three, as I, as I said, um, which reads, in accordance with an early tradition in the church, Abelard suggests that women can be ordained holy leaders, deaconesses, who are equal to the male equivalent of deacons, evaluate his letters and writings to explain how he supports this idea and whether he practices what he preaches. <clears throat> Does he treat Heloise as a social equal after they are both ordained? So to begin answering this question, we should really start with a basic outline of the events that occurred uh, between Heloise and Abelard before their correspondence began. Um, and by the way, we, we have learned recently that there are over 100 um, letters between them. And uh, on the course website, we get just a few, just uh, six letters. So Abelard is a famous uh, philosopher uh, and teacher who becomes infatuated with Heloise, who at this point is a young student of his. Um, they begin a mutual flirtation and relationship, and Abelard is able to influence Heloise's uncle to hire him as essentially her personal tutor, her personal teacher. Um, and during this situation of employment, um, he seduces her, and they become lovers and develop a relationship. Um, they secretly marry, and Heloise has a child by Abelard, initially with the uncle's approval. However, when the uncle wants to make the marriage more known and more public, <clears throat> Abelard disagrees um, with this and sends Heloise instead uh, to a convent. The uncle is incensed and has Abelard castrated by men under his employment. Uh, and when this occurs, Abelard also confines himself into seclusion in a monastery. <clears throat> so the set, uh, the stage is really set here for the rather extensive epistolary exchange between Abelard and Heloise. Um, the primary theme of these letters, of course, has to do with their relationship and the feelings they have for each other, despite their physical uh, separation, um, and also despite the mutilation that Abelard endured, which we'll touch on in a few minutes. However, there's also an interesting power play um, between Abelard and Heloise in this uh, text, in these letters, revolving around the role of uh, Heloise as an abbess and her spiritual duties at large as well. Um, as the epistolary exchange unfolds, Abelard emphasizes the fact that uh, she needs to abolish thoughts of love and her feelings and focus instead on her on her spiritual life. <clears throat> In addition, he, dict he dictates to her specific directions for what we would call best practices, uh, to use the current phrasing, revolving around spiritual guidance um, that she offers her nuns. Uh, this was really not unusual, as it was common practice for monks, essentially, to take charge of nunneries. Um, however, the power play involved in this exchange is notable. One interesting essay I read is Andrea Nye's um, A Woman's Thought or a Man's Discipline, The Letters of Abelard and Heloise. And in this, she writes, by the time of Heloise's letters to Abelard, however, it was clear that she had greatly disappointed her teacher. Abelard answers her letters reluctantly, tired of her continual complaint and her lack of rationality. Rationality in quotes here. He makes it clear how unphilosophical and sinful he finds what she says on the subjects of love, ethics, personal obligation, and the church. And this comes from page three. Abelard clearly does love Heloise. However, interestingly enough, he also views it as a source of weakness and shame. This is clear in the first letter to Philintus about Heloise when Abelard writes on page six from her text. Um, and now, my friend, I'm going to expose to you all my weaknesses. All men, I believe, are under a necessity of paying tribute at some time or another to love. The word tribute is an interesting word choice. 
voice here as if he is offering his respects to a much greater power as one does when offering tribute to a king or an emperor, perhaps. So while Abelard wants to uh, repress or maybe snuff out his feelings of love, there's also here simultaneously the notion that love is an external power that one cannot control, perhaps shades of Boethius here on um, fortune. Uh, even in this first letter, uh, Abelard views love as an obstacle to his studies. Uh, later in the letters, however, to me, there's a growing sense that Abelard views his relationship with Heloise as a sin, and that now that he's in a monastery, it is time for him to do penance and for her to do the same. In terms of her duties in, as an abbess, among many other things, Abelard gives Heloise instructions on the necessity of prayer. Quote, there are many proofs and examples showing the great influence the prayers of the faithful may have with God and his saints, especially the prayers of women for their dear ones and of wives for their husbands. With this particularly in mind, the apostle admonishes us to pray without ceasing. Uh, Abelard also emphasizes that it is vital to consider the collective of nuns around her and to think in terms of community and not just her own personal salvation. He writes, um, quote, but if you alone should prove unable to obtain what you desire, that holy community of virgins and widows who are with you will obtain what you cannot achieve by yourself. For when truth says to his di uh, disciplines, this comes from Matthew 18, uh, 20, where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. And again, if two of you agree over any request that you make on earth, it will be granted them by my Father who is in heaven. Who can fail to see how influential with God is the frequent prayer of a holy congregation? So here he also underscores the influence of reading the Bible um, with devotion. Uh, none of these suggestions are particularly surprising, but his but Abelard's insistence upon them is really worth noting because earlier in their letters, Abelard grapples more readily with his emotions and is less concerned perhaps with their daily activities. In my reading, Abelard seems to view himself as in charge of the, of the relationship and in charge of Heloise as her former master. Uh, he refers to this term, in fact, uh, several times. At no point in the letters is there a sense that they are peers um, or that he views Heloise as, a, as an equal, exactly. Instead, um, Abelard is often offering advice and directions to Heloise. The, po the power dynamics, to me, are very clear. Um, perhaps this is influenced by the fact that she is his former student, so it's a kind of a pedagogical um, uh, power play. Or perhaps this is influenced by the fact that she is younger and a woman, or maybe it has to do with the um, sort of strident expectations of the day regarding gender and the role of men and women in the church. Or perhaps it's some combination of all of these. Um, the only times when Abelard seems to view himself on equal footing with Eloise is really when he addresses uh, the subject of love, which they both are are struggling with and grappling with. This is in stark contrast to Heloise's letters to Abelard. Um, in her letters, it is clear uh, that she truly loves him and that she is pained uh, by, their, by their physical separation. She is also quite frank with him in pointing out his contradictions or problems regarding his demands that she sees. Um, this is par for the course during the time, in a sense, in that uh, letters were not merely private exchanges, but were also viewed as a chance to explore ideas on a limited stage, perhaps something akin to social media. Um, as Babette Hellmans writes in her uh, essay, The Immeasurability of the Monastic Mind, writing about Peter Abelard, Quote, writing letters allowed the literati of the period to express themselves in polemics. Uh, this habit of exchanging arguments 
extending discussions beyond the subject of mere life events was the base on which intellectual communities were structured. Hellman's continues, quote, the intellectual and cultural context of monasticism also forces us to rethink how it is possible that the main characters of this love affair, Abelard and Heloise, also want to be good followers of the Benedictine rule. So while these are technically private correspondences, these letters are also an attempt to figure out where they stand um, on issues pertaining to faith and duty and their interpretation of the role of monks and nuns within the cloister. So these letters have really a social and organizational function at this time, as we can see. In letter five, Heloise writes, quote, you tell me one thing that perplexes me that you have heard of, that you have heard that some of our sisters are bad examples and that they are generally not strict enough. Ought this to seem strange to you who know how monasteries are filled nowadays? Do fathers consult the inclination of their children when they settle them? Are they not interested in policy and their only rules? This is the reason that monasteries are often filled with those who are a scandal to them. So here she's pinpointing the fact that uh, monasteries, too, are not blameless in providing, quote, bad examples, uh, as Abelard points out. But she also indicates that if he were physically close to her, it would make it much easier for her to do her job. Uh, she does indicate that she values his thoughts and his insights regarding that. Also in letter five, Heloise writes, uh, quote, a young nun who had been forced to enter the convent without a vocation thereof, therefore, is by a stratagem I know nothing of, escaped and fled to England with a gentleman. I have ordered all the house to conceal the matter. Ah, Abelard, if you were near us, these things would not happen. For all the sisters, charmed with seeing and hearing you, would think of nothing but practicing your rules and directions. Letter six takes a painful turn, however, in Abelard's um, pen, uh, where his tone and uh, his, the firmness of, of his writing really indicates to me that he recommends they snuff out the candle of their feelings for each other. Uh, and in letter six, he views love as incompatible with their much more holy duties. An example is uh, when he writes, quote, write no more to me, Heloise, write no more to me. It is time to end communications which make our penances of naught avail. We retire from the world to purify ourselves, and by a conduct directly contrary to Christian morality, we became odious to Jesus Christ. Let us no more deceive ourselves with remembrance of our past pleasures, but we make our lives troubled and spoil the sweets of solitude. Let us make good use of our austerities and no longer preserve the memories of our crimes amongst the severities of penance. Let a mortification of body and mind, a strict fasting, continual solitude, profound and holy med meditations, and a sincere love of God succeed our former irregularities. That last word, irregularities, and his referencing to their sin and their need to purify themselves, to me, it gives a further indication that Abelard views their relationship as a mistake and something they need to cleanse themselves of and do away with. Um, to use a Freudian term, perhaps, Abelard suggests they sublimate their love and turn that energy, uh, that former uh, passion, into something more beneficial, uh, really by devoting themselves to God. He calls their love a, quote, terrible temptation. Uh, and as a result, uh, he recommends, uh, sorry, as a result, um, the recommendations detailed earlier regarding community prayer and Bible reading are our way of dealing with their love in Abelard's view. Perhaps the most compelling letter, however, is the third letter, uh, which shows the reader uh, Abelard in his most tortured grappling uh, with his emotional state. In this letter, the reader can fully understand that he both loves Heloise, but also that he wants to move on and liberate himself from the tortured state in which he exists. In this letter, he writes, quote, but heaven is still inexorable because my passion still lives in me. The fire is only covered over with deceitful ashes and cannot be extinguished but by extraordinary grace. 
We deceive men, but nothing, nothing is hid from God. This is on page 44. Here it is clear that Abelard wants to extinguish the fire of his love, which still exists lying dormant over deceitful ashes. And this metaphor uh, of the fire is interesting because it indicates that at any point that fire may ignite again, the sparks may may fly again, um, but God watches over it all, Abelard suggests. And he continues, quote, regard me no more, I entreat you as a founder or, or any great personage. Your praises ill agree with my many weaknesses. I am a miserable sinner, prostrate before my judge, and with my face pressed to the earth, I mix my tears with the earth. Can you see me in this posture and solicit me to love you? Come if you think fit, and in your holy, in, in your holy habit, thrust yourself between God, my God, and me, and be a wall of separation. So here, Abelard's feelings of shame in this passage are really overwhelming. Um, but I have to wonder if this is also guilt. Um, some critics have suggested that perhaps Abelard um, forced himself upon Heloise in their relationship and that um, uh, they use the evidence of the language of his sexual union or his descriptions of that uh, with her in the first letter Um where the language does suggest this, uh, he says, I saw her, I loved her, I evolved to make her love me. Almost like I came, I saw, I conquered. Um, and that last phrase does suggest a certain level of forcing himself upon her and using perhaps the leverage uh, of his role as teacher. Um, or perhaps on the other hand, is this the punishment he received from Heloise's uncle speaking? Is this the castration that is coloring or influencing his view of their relationship or their their former relationship really Catherine crawford in her uh really interesting essay called desiring castrates how to create disabled social subjects uh, she writes quote abelard refers to his castration as my mutilation and admits feeling shame and humiliation uh page 75 uh having lost his masculinity in a mode typical of medieval Christian hagiography, Abelard turns I'm sorry, turns objection into a divine test that he can display fortitude in passing. He allows how just a judgment of God has struck me in the parts of the body with which I had sinned, coming from page 75. The new Abelard would channel his energies into, agnost into an agnostic intellectual combat in this reading, Abelard frames his castration as part of his claim to be fully masculine, masculine. But Abelard both denies and renounces this desire. So in my interpretation, perhaps uh, Crawford is suggesting that Abelard distances himself from Heloise since he believes that he is incapable of sex and incapable of intercourse. And as a result, he's filled with shame uh, and, and feelings of guilt. And this seems quite likely, actually, uh, even from an outsider's perspective, because knowing that his phys his physical situation is uh, limited, that he's mutilated, um, which he hardly ever references in his letters, this helps us understand his his uh, psychological bearing. Uh, Andrea Nye is also rather critical of Abelard, despite his mutilated state. Uh, in her essay, she claims that the aggressive milit quote. The aggressive military style of this ped uh, pedagogical discipline is consistent with the style of Abelard's new philosophical logic. In his autobiography, Abelard describes logic in martial terms. Like his soldier father, he is a professional fighter, a fighter with words. Um, so Nye is really viewing Heloise as someone who is critiquing the tradition of uh, medieval arranged marriages and um rebelling against Abelard and is also embracing her inner state, that of love, even if it flies in the face of contemporary expectations and his dictates regarding what she does in the nunnery as an abbess. As a nun and abbess, uh, continuing with Nye, uh, she wrote from the one situation in which medieval women lived relatively free from men's control. Although Heloise bowed to the official ruling that convents be supervised by monks as well as to Abelard's demands that her policies as an abbess be guided by himself as male ad advisor. Uh, in practice, her autonomy must have been considerable. 
her responsibilities as abbess required considerable administrative and uh, doctrinal skill. This was especially true because, as Heloise complained, so little had been done to define the terms of a monastic rule for women. Uh, this is really a fascinating insight to me by, by Nye, because she argues that Heloise is free, actually, but with a caveat that Abelard continues to attempt to control her through these letters with his words and his directions. Um, Heloise wants care. Uh, she wants love. Abelard wants control. Uh, and Nye continues on page seven to mention that, quote, on this understanding of love, Abelard's castration is irrelevant. A love based on mutual responsibility and care survives physical disability. It is clear Heloise concludes that Abelard never loved, but was driven by a selfish craving for genital satisfaction. To me, this is difficult to prove, uh, and it tends to go against the grain of Abelard's words in his early letters, um, if we take them at face value. Crawford would also perhaps disagree um, from, uh, with this statement, because how can Abelard's castration be irrelevant? Um, his phenomenological state really here is that he's mutilated, he's castrated, that is who he is. His directions and attempt to maintain control as master and teacher and lover, or ex-lover, seem to me the direct output of his otherness as a man, his emasculation, his castration. Um, of course, he does want control, um, but perhaps he, uh, Abelard is attempting to control um, Eloise and her uh, her position as an abbess, or even understand himself by controlling Eloise. Um, in other words, his sexuality is squashed, but is hers. Uh, he hopes to squash hers as well. If he if he cannot make love to Eloise, nobody should be able to. In conclusion, uh, in conclusion, I would like to return to the question at hand. Does Abelard treat Eloise as a social equal after they're both ordained? Uh, certainly not. Uh, perhaps this is a result of his confinement, uh, the gender expectations of the day, and his castration, as mentioned. Uh, but this is an absolute impossibility. He does not view her as a social equal. Rather than treating Heloise as a social equal, Abelard's letters to me indicate that he views her as someone who needs his help and also advice. Uh, in the third letter, Abelard writes in what may be his most honest statement, uh, quote, I did not persuade you to religion out of any regard to your happiness, but condemned you to it like an enemy who destroys what he cannot carry off. Very honest words by Abelard. Uh, and not only is this in keeping with the military language referenced earlier, but it also underscores the notion <clears throat> that if Abelard cannot have Heloise for himself, he can attempt to control her, at least with his influ very influential words. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed the presentation and look forward to seeing the others. Have a nice day.